I'll read to you the whole email and then I'll go back through it line by line and we can talk about it. So here's where it starts. I heard your message on hell. There is no place that God is going to torment and torture anyone. You keep preaching that and you will scare millions, torment millions, and please the constituency you already have. Jesus is the savior of the world, but you are blind and cannot believe the words of scripture. Rodney is right and you will not listen or refute, you are a coward. Gives his phone number. Call me coward. You will not call me or Rodney because you are a dishonest religious coward. And then there's a section when you complete the online form that asks anything else you'd like to share. And so he had something he wanted to share. Stop teaching lies about God. So that was the one of the emails we received. And I thought I would just go through this with you because I think it'd be worthwhile to do that. So let's go line by line. The first line is this. I heard your message on hell. There is no place that God is going to torment and torture anyone. So get Revelation 14, verse 9. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9. And what the, the author of the email here is saying is there is no place that God is going to torment and torture anyone. So let's read Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So does the Bible say that people are tormented? That's specifically what it says. They're tormented with fire and brimstone. You've probably heard this. What, what is, is often said, I, I have no way of knowing whether it's true or not, but that burns are the most painful wound that you can have. That's what's often said. They're certainly not pleasant. Well, there's people that are tormented with fire. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment, that obviously relates to the fire, ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So are people tormented? Yes. How long are they tormented? Forever and ever. Do they ever get a break? No. Because they have no rest day nor night. So I make the observation that people say, well, there's no torment. A loving God wouldn't do that. You're just ignoring what the words on the page plainly say. It's more than obvious. So here's the next thing he says. I heard your message on hell. I'm going to reread part of this. I heard your message on hell. There is no place that God is going to torment and torture anyone. You keep preaching that and you will scare millions, torment millions, and please the constituency you already have. So what he's saying there is that when someone teaches on hell, they're doing that to please people. So let me ask you this question. Who do you think is in the man-pleasing business? Someone who preaches there is a literal eternal torment in hell or someone who says universalism? Which one of those people is in the man-pleasing business? Isn't it obvious who is? The universalist is in the man-pleasing business. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3.
While you're turning there, I'll just make this point. When someone says that there's a literal torment in hell, they do so on the basis of very clear Bible verses. What do you think is the responsibility of someone that says, well, the Bible doesn't actually teach there's a hell. Everyone is saved. How do you think that is going to turn out at the judgment seat of Christ? When you give people false comfort and you tell them, you don't have to worry about hell. There's no such thing as eternal torment. Everyone is saved. That's about the most wicked thing you can do. I'd rather be an alcoholic than say that. Right? I'd rather be a drug abuser. I, God forbid that I ever say that. You're lying to people and damning them to hell is what you're doing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So what Scripture specifically tells you is going to happen at the end of the dispensation of grace is what are people going to be like? They're going to have itching ears. And they're going to want you to speak smooth words to them to make them feel good. Now notice verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So people have itching ears, and are those itching ears itching to hear the truth? No, they're itching for falsehood, and so what do they do? They turn away from the truth, and they turn to fables. Universalism is a fable, you realize that. It's just completely and utterly false. People that teach universalism are looking for a scripturally uninformed audience that they can minister to. Because if you simply read the words on the page, would you recognize there's a hell, there's a lake of fire, there is torment, and it lasts forever? Now this next part was in all caps. So this is important. But you are blind and cannot believe the words of Scripture. So I'm going to read a passage to you. And after I read the passage to you, you tell me who's not believing the words of Scripture. The person that preaches hell or the universalist. So here's the passage. Get Mark chapter 9 and verse 43. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. And we're going to read several verses together. And these are really complicated, complex verses to understand. I, I want you to tell me what they mean. Mark 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, I can't figure out what that passage is about. What do you think that passage is about? <laughs> hell, but I, I thought, what, really? It says six times the fire shall never be quenched. Now, you're probably aware of this. What do modern versions do in Mark 9? Do you see where verse 44, 46, and 48 all say the same thing? 
where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. What modern versions will do is they will say, that's a copyist error. And so when it says the same thing three times, the copyist made a mistake and copied it too many times. And so they, took, they take out two of them. Have you ever in your life as a child had an adult figure say something to you more than once because they want you to get it, right? Isn't one of the things we do for emphasis to repeat ourselves? So like, for example, you might say to a child, I don't want you to play in the street. And so just to make sure that you understand me, I don't want you to go past the sidewalk. I don't want you to be in the street. You have to stay in the yard. And you might say that more than once because the gravity of not understanding it is so extreme. So you repeat yourself, right? How often should you preach the gospel? Should you preach the gospel once and then say, well, I've met my quota for the year? Or do you preach the gospel more than once because of the importance of it, the gravity, right? Mark 9 could not be more clear. There's a hell. There's a fire that shall not be quenched. Universalism says everyone that's saved. Look at verse 45. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell. Doesn't that suggest that not everyone is saved? By the way, if, if, if this matters to you, those are in the red letters. So who's speaking this? This is Jesus Christ speaking this. Now, I, I believe the whole Bible should be in red letters because I think the entire Bible is the Word of God, so I'm not much into red letters. But you do realize in Mark 9, Jesus Christ is speaking. So Jesus Christ himself believed in hell, six times said the fire shall not be quenched, says the worm dieth not, describing the state of the lost man's soul in hell. So... Who's not believing the words of Scripture? The person that believes in hell or the universalist? So here's the next part. Rodney is right, and you will not listen. And then there were some typos. All caps, you are a coward. Then the phone number, so I'm supposed to call him. Call me, coward. You will not call me or Rodney because you are a dishonest religious coward. So if you haven't caught on, I'm a coward. So this is my response to that. What I have found over the years is that people who call names typically don't have a valid point. So you can decide for yourself whether or not you think that's true. But it's just an ad hominem attack. Get with me 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. First Corinthians 15 and verse 32. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Let's understand what verse 33 is saying. Evil communications corrupt good manners. The issue in verse 32 is whether or not there is a resurrection. So look at verse 32 again. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? In other words, 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection. Paul's making the point that this life isn't all there is. There is a resurrection and a, ne a next life. When he says, what advantageth it me? Why would I fight with the beasts at Ephesus? What he's saying is, I, I would have to be an idiot to spend my life being persecuted for the gospel if there is no next life, why would I do that? Then I, I'm just suffering for no point. Let me read it again just so, so you see it. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Why would I do that? That'd be a waste of time. Notice what he then says. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. 
what Paul says there is, if there is no resurrection and there is no next life, then you ought to live for this life. And that logically makes sense. If there is no next life, if this is all there is, then have as much fun as you can in this life. But of course, his whole point is, there is a next life. That's what the whole chapter is about. Now, what he says in verse 33 is this, evil communications corrupt good manners. So let me give you this illustration. If I teach people there is no next life, this is all there is, are they going to behave righteously or are they going to live in the flesh? They're going to live in the flesh. I'll give you another example. If I teach people you're not created in the image of God, you're just a bald monkey, right? All you are is you're an ape that now doesn't have enough hair. Isn't there a difference in how you think about yourself? There's a difference whether you think about yourself as I am created in the image of God and I bear the image of my creator, a divine transcendent God. I am fundamentally a spiritual being. That's different from you're just an animal that is one further step along the evolutionary journey. Those different worldviews will produce different behaviors. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you tell people they're an animal, don't be surprised if they live like an animal, right? So now let me suggest this to you. So what if I tell people there is no judgment seat of Christ and you don't have to give account of yourself to God and you're all saved anyway. Well, how do you think people are going to behave? Are people going to walk in the spirit as a result of that? Or are they going to walk in the flesh? The natural result of that teaching, in other words, the natural result of there is no judgment seat of Christ, you don't give account of yourselves to God, and everyone is saved, is lost people will stay lost, and saved people will live like lost people. Because what you're telling him is it doesn't matter. If there is no judgment seat of Christ, why would a saved person, what's the consequence of you living in sin? There is none. So this teaching is evil communications corrupt good manners. Now, what I'll just say, I'll say this further then. So if that's what you teach people, you're going to corrupt their manners, and they're going to write emails like this. That email is the fruit of evil communications, false teaching, where they write silly stuff like that. Doesn't Matthew 12, 36 say that men shall give account of every idle word? Well, if you're going to give account of every idle word, then you had not to say dumb things. Right? You ought to be very thoughtful and careful about what you say. But if you tell people it doesn't matter, there's no judgment seat of Christ, you don't have to give account, people are going to live like that's true. It's not true. My point is this, doctrine has consequences. It just does. It will affect how you live. This email that, that I received, it's the f natural fruit of a universalist ministry. That's what it is. So let me say this to my email correspondent. Universalism is a false gospel. I say, this, I say all this with sincerity and love. Universalism is a false gospel. There is a hell. It is a place of literal torment. We've looked at some verses that prove that. There's a bunch more. Hell is real. Don't kid yourself. It's real. The good news is this. Although hell is real and the punishment is eternal and it is torment on the authority of Revelation 14, you don't have to go there. And you don't have to go there because Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. So in, in, consistent with 2 Corinthians 5, I would say that I, I beseech you to be reconciled to God. 
by believing the gospel that Christ died for your sins. That way you don't have to pay the penalty for your own sins. He paid them for you. So I would, I would encourage you in that regard.